Hey there, I'm sure you've seen this. This is your favorite double A battery or a cell. This powers your TV remotes. This powers your wall clocks. Basically, it actually powers a lot of important things in your life, isn't it? Now, in this video, we'll talk about how this actually works. Do you remember the galvanic cell? I'm sure you do. If not, I recommend you quickly recollect it. This was the galvanic cell that we know of. We have a salt bridge, we have an anode and a cathode, and two solutions, one with a zinc sulfate and one with the copper sulfate. But this cell is not a practical cell. You can't keep carrying around beakers and solutions. We can't use this in our daily lives. So, we need the practical galvanic cell, which is light, compact, and has enough voltage to power the things that we want to use. So, scientists built two kinds of practical galvanic cells. The first is called the primary cell or the primary battery. Remember that a battery could be either one cell or more cells. In this video, we'll stick to saying cell. We also have a secondary cell or a secondary battery. This is your primary cell. And this is your secondary cell. This kind of battery is found in your mobile phones. And the first one is the primary cell, which is found more in your alarm clocks or your wall clocks or TV remotes. I'm sure you're getting the difference. Yes, the primary cells, the primary batteries are ones which cannot be recharged. You use them once and you throw them away. And they are typically cheaper. The second types are the ones in your favorite cell phones, also in your cars and your laptops, which are rechargeable. You can recharge them again and again and again. And you can reuse them, but they tend to be more expensive. In this video, we want to dive deep into the primary cell. But why can't the primary cell be recharged? To answer that question, let's look inside the battery. Let's talk about the first type of primary cell, which is also called the dry cell or the Leclanche cell, which is named after a French guy. We could also say Leclanche if you want, but the actual pronunciation from France is Leclanche. So this is your AA battery. And here's how it looks inside. Let's look at the parts. So you have a zinc casing, which forms the anode, which is a negative terminal. And you have a paste inside, which is a combination of manganese dioxide and a carbon black paste, along with ammonium chloride and zinc chloride, which is basically forming the electrolyte. And you also have a carbon graphite rod, which acts like a cathode, sort of. I'll explain more why. I say sort of cathode, and it forms the positive terminal. Let's look at the reaction step by step. Now let's see the chemical reactions inside the cell. To do that, we need to connect the cell to an external circuit. As you remember, if you have the normal AA battery, it doesn't start getting used up, right? Only when you connect it to a device, it starts getting used up. Because if you just kept the battery aside, it doesn't die on its own. Only if you start using it, after a while, it dies. So, that means for the reaction to start happening, you need to connect it to an external circuit. We'll answer why that happens as well. So step one, zinc gets oxidized and releases electrons. So we have the zinc metal in the zinc casing, which gets oxidized to become the Zn2 plus ion and it releases two electrons. So when the zinc is in the metal, it remains in the solid form, but once it becomes an ion, it no longer can stay in the solid form. So it goes into the electrolyte paste and it releases these two electrons. And what do you think happens to these electrons? Think about it. Do you think they go into the electrolyte paste and react with manganese dioxide? No. What exactly happens is that the electrons actually travel through the circuit. They leave the battery and enter the circuit. These electrons, when they leave the circuit, and that is why this zinc casing is called the anode or the negative terminal because it creates these electrons and it is negative in charge. And this is the reaction. Zinc solid gives you zinc 2 plus ion plus 2 electrons. And next, next what happens is these electrons travel through the external conductor wire and enter the carbon rod again. So basically what's happening here is these electrons are entering the wire here and then they are traveling entirely through the wire and then they enter the carbon rod 
into the battery once again. And that's how they're powering the equipment as well because these electrons have to drive through the circuit for you to power any equipment in between here, correct? So this is how that happens. And once they enter the carbon rod, is the high of the next step. So the carbon rod here is just a conductor. It is merely a conductor. It does not actually take place in the reaction, which is what a normal cathode would do. But we still say it's the cathode just for the sake of simplicity because it actually takes in the electrons. It is physically taking in the electrons. So for the purpose of your exams, you can say that the carbon rod is a cathode and you would be given full mark. So let's keep that in mind. Technically, it's not the cathode, but we say it is the cathode because it takes in electrons. So next, what happens? Step three, manganese dioxide gets reduced, converting manganese dioxide to manganese oxide hydroxide. But since the electrons are eventually passed through the carbon, we call that the cathode or positive terminal. And yet, the actual reduction happens in the manganese dioxide. And this is the reaction. Manganese dioxide plus ammonium ion plus an electron gives you manganese oxide hydroxide plus ammonia. And this is what you need to remember. So, putting this together, we have at the anode or the negative terminal, we have the loss of electrons through zinc, where zinc becomes zinc ion plus two electrons. And at the cathode, we have reduction or the gain of electrons. So, this is the actual technical cathode, but in the, ca in the case of physical cathode, which is the carbon dot, but technically in the ca cathode where reduction happens, we have manganese becoming manganese oxide hydroxide. So, clearly, we are going from zero from zinc to a plus two oxidation state, and that's why it's called oxidation. And from manganese, we're going from plus four to a plus three oxidation state, and that's why it's called a reduction. And remember that this kind of writing these reactions is a simplified version. It is not the actual, exactly what actually happens inside the battery. But the, for the purposes of our understanding, this is good enough. Now, this is another kind of battery which is the second type of battery called the mercury cell. So here are the parts. We have the anode, we have, a, we have the cathode, we have the anode cap, we have the cell can, and we have a separator. We also have a gasket. If you look at the reactions inside the mercury cell, we have at the anode, we see ZnHg plus 2OH minus giving Zn zinc oxide plus water plus two electrons. And these two electrons are what go through the circuit. And at the cathode, we see mercury oxide plus water plus two electrons giving rise to mercury plus two hydroxide ions. And this is what the cathode, they take in the electrons and they get reduced. This is again the simplified version. So let's answer the question, why does a dry cell die? Which I asked you before, that's where we started all this investigation, correct? So as the battery operates, chemical changes happen that can't be reversed. Zinc consumption, mainly the zinc that gets used up in our primary battery, the dry cell gets used up in the reaction. It literally gets used up in the reaction. It's actually, if you measure the thickness of the zinc casing before and after the cell is used, you will see that you will have no zinc. Like for example, here we have shown in a simplified way that the zinc gets used up. So you can see no zinc over here. And that's how the voltage drops with time, as you can see in the graph over here. So electrolyte changes also happen. The chemicals inside become too dilute to work effectively. That's why primary batteries can't be recharged. So once the zinc is gone, it's gone for good and you can't get it back. It's something like you burn a paper and the paper turns into ash and smell and fire and uh, uh, sound also sometimes. So that you cannot reverse back into a paper, no matter what you do. You have learned about reversible and reversible changes in lower grades, right? So certain changes cannot be reversed back. Cannot be reversed. Certain changes cannot be reversed. So the key point is, unlike rechargeable batteries, these chemical changes in primary batteries are irreversible. So if we compare a dry cell to a mercury cell, these are the key points. So a dry cell, we use it in TV remotes and everyday devices. We use it in wall clocks and timers, toys and portable electronics. The characteristics are they are cheap and widely available. Voltage declines over time and they are lightweight and versatile. Whereas mercury cells, they are mainly used in smaller devices like hearing aids and medical devices, watches and precision timers and scientific instruments. 
because the key difference is that the mercury cell has a very stable voltage. Usually, the dry cell has a voltage of about 1.5 volts, whereas the mercury cell has a voltage of around 1.35 volts. And the main difference, as we saw in the previous graph, is that for a dry cell, the voltage drops something like this. But for a mercury cell, the voltage remains more or less constant until it dies off. So the key difference is that dry cells have a declining voltage as they are used, while mercury cells maintain nearly constant voltage until completely depleted. Right? I think we've had a lot of learning today about dry cells and mainly primary cells. I hope you had fun. I'll see you next time.